All right, looks like we've got a good group joining us here. So again, we're here with Dr. Katie Olette Harrington, who is a doctor of physical therapy and a pelvic health specialist, as well as a pregnancy and postpartum corrective exercise specialist. I know she's continuing to add more certifications. You're pursuing a breastfeeding lactation consultant, is that right? Yes. Yes, certification as well. So she's in the midst of that. So she's always learning more and more and more so she can help our patients in our community. Um, I do want to share that anybody who's joining here, if you have a question at any point during the webinar, there is a Q&A button on your screen. You can click that anytime to ask a question and we'll answer those at the end of the webinar. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Katie. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's go over our objectives for this presentation. So we are looking to understand the anatomy and functions of your pelvic floor and core, understand what happens to your body during pregnancy and delivery and how this can affect functioning, learn the risk factors for diastasis and prolapse and how to manage your symptoms, and then learn how pelvic floor therapy can help both of these things. So a little bit about my professional background, I did my Associates of Applied Science um, at Delta, and then I got my certification for personal training, transferred to Central to get my bachelor's and my doctorate. And then as Kate said, I have been doing continuing education um, since even before I graduated for all the pelvic floor stuff. Personal background, I live in Midland with my family, um, two-step kids, baby, and our dog. Um, we are avid campers, hikers, and I'm also a runner. Looking over female bodied anatomy. So on this first picture on the side here, on the left side here, this is um, if your body was like cut in half lengthwise, like a hot dog bun, and we're looking in from the side, you can see your bladder, your uterus and your vaginal, vaginal canal, and then your rectum. And then on the front is your pubic bone, the back is your sacrum and your tailbone. And then all of this like pinkish orange are your pelvic floor muscles. So they're connecting from your pubic bone to your tailbone and kind of act like a hammock or a sling. And then from the image on the right side, it's like we're looking from the bottom up. So this front part would be your tailbone. I'm sorry, pubic bone. The back part would be your tailbone. And then here we have your urethra opening, vaginal opening, and rectal opening. And then all of this red are your pelvic floor muscles. And then this would be your glute muscle. So we have three different layers of our pelvic floor muscles. Each layer has a different job, but they work collectively to do all the things we need them to do. So on to the functions of our pelvic floor. We like to think of the five S's. So one is support of those pelvic organs. Um, two is sphincter control. So closing off the urethral and rectal opening. So we don't pee and poop when we don't want to pee and poop. Those muscles also have to be able to relax to let everything out. These muscles also help with stabilization. So helping with stabilization of those organs, also stabilization of our um, joints. So our pelvic floor muscles work directly with our core, low back and hip muscles to make sure everything is staying stabilized and moving the way it's supposed to. Our pelvic floor muscles also have sexual function, so ability to have an orgasm and pleasure with sex. Um, if these muscles are dysfunctional um, or not working the way we want them to, it can cause pain with intercourse or difficulty achieving an orgasm. And then these muscles also have what we call a sump pump mechanism as it works with the diaphragm. So if this top is your diaphragm, the bottom is your pelvic floor. When you breathe in, they should lower. And when you exhale or breathe out, they should come back up. So that's where that pistoning motion comes in. And that is, again, happens with the deep breathing. It also helps with like lymphatic and fluid flow. So what makes up your core? It's not just your abdominal muscles. So if we think about the cores like a pop can, the bottom is the pelvic floor. The top is your diaphragm. The front would be this transversus abdominis muscle right here. So it kind of wraps around like a corset. And then the back is of the pop can is muscles that line along your, um, lie along your spine. So pelvic floor is again, is the base of the support of your core. It has the five S's for the functions. For the transversus abdominis, it is your deepest core muscle. And its main job is to stabilize the spine, the pelvic floor, and the pelvis. And all of these muscles of our core work collectively and synergistically before movement to lengthen and stabilize the spine, pelvis, and pelvic organs. 
So our diaphragm, like I said, is the top of the pop can and it moves with breathing and helps the pelvic floor move. And then the back muscle is called your multifidus. It's a group of short, deep muscles that lay along your spine. So what does our core look like at work? So we have this breathing or pistoning mechanism here. So this is what I talked about um, when you breathe in, your diaphragm lowers and flattens. And when you breathe out, it comes back up. So this is a good visual of what that looks like and how even the support, um, how they even give support to the pelvic organs. This also helps with pressure control. So this canister, the pop can balance, is important for controlling an increase in intra-abdominal pressure and decreasing pressure onto the pelvic floor. So when we are increasing pressure down to the pelvic floor and increasing intra-abdominal pressure, that can be a risk factor for pelvic organ prolapse and a diastasis or the DRA as you're going to see in this slide. I just shortened it. So pregnancy is one of the leading causes of diastasis or DRA. So what happens during pregnancy that can contribute? So you have blood volume and heart rate um, increases, our rib cage expands, the diaphragm will then lift and the lung volume decreases. So we're not getting that natural lengthening and strengthening of the pelvic floor with breathing. Um, the uterus can compress on the pelvic vein, so that can just cause extra pressure down to the pelvic floor. We also will have stretch-induced weakness of the abdominals and pelvic floor because of all the pressure coming down, but also obviously as baby grows, your stomach's getting bigger. So again, this increases pressure onto the pelvic organs. Pregnancy is also a risk factor for pelvic organ prolapse, especially vaginal deliveries and subsequent vaginal deliveries. Um, this also causes a forward head and the shoulders to round to counteract the center of mass and then your low back will arch. So this change in posture can lead to um, different things like low back pain, SI joint pain, sciatic type symptoms, neck pain, and headaches. And then when we're in pain, our muscles actually um, don't fire as well. And there can be an incoordination there, which then can alter how our body is taking on that intra-abdominal pressure or those extra forces that come on with coughing, sneezing, laughing, and lifting. So here are our most common impairments following pregnancy. And again, right now we're just going to focus on the diastasis and the pelvic organ prolapse. And I will say that even if your pregnancy was 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, you're still postpartum and your body can still be affected by this. So it, you're not a lost cause and it can still be addressed. So we're gonna look at the DRA or the diastasis recti abdominis first. So this is a separation of your rectus abdominis muscle and overstretching of the linea alba. So the linea alba is a connective tissue that's in between these two rectus muscle, which I'll put this in air quotes, your six pack, your six pack muscles. And then this is um, one type of separation um, over on this side. So it's normal for most pregnant women um, and it does continue postpartum on occasion. So possible symptoms connected to this are low back pain, hip pain, pelvic girdle pain, abdominal pain, incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, and difficulty lifting heavy objects. Myths and facts of diastasis. So myth number one is DRA is always problematic, and if there's still a separation, that means it's not healed. The fact is that you can have a functional separation with no side effects and no difficulty doing your normal activities. Myth number two is DRA means the abdominal muscles are torn. The fact is the muscles are still intact. They are just separated due to that linea alba or that connective tissue being stretched out. So the muscles aren't actually torn. Um, it's just that connective tissue is stretched. So then the muscles are stretched. Myth number three, if there's coning or doming during exercise, then these are bad exercises and I should stop. The fact is when this happens, it's a sign there's an increase in intra-abdominal pressure that's uncontrolled. So what that means is your muscles are just not doing the job they're supposed to be doing. So also take note of soft versus hard doming. So soft doming is when that um, spot domes, if you kind of press your fingers in and it still feels kind of soft and squishy, you can sink your fingers in and feel the muscle bellies on each side then that's okay because these um, the muscles are not at their end range. Whereas if when you dome and you're feeling and it's like hard tension, 
then that means they are at their end range and that can increase, um, possibly make that diastasis worse. Um, I would also pay attention to when you're doming, what does it feel like in your pelvic floor? So if you feel extra pressure onto your pelvic floor and that happens, so the opposite of a Kegel, so a Kegel is when our pelvic floor muscles tighten. If you're feeling the opposite of that, where there's like a lot of pressure or bulging down, then I would probably stop because that means that um, there's too much unmanaged pressure. And then myth number four is doing exercise like sit-ups, crunches, or planks will make the diastasis worse. There's not sufficient evidence that these exercises actually make a diastasis worse. And a recent study demonstrated that a 12-week program of abdominal curl-ups five days per week did not increase the separation, but it did result in improvement in abdominal muscle strength. Now, this does not mean that I want you to go out and do dozens of sit-ups, crunches, and planks. Um, I would make sure that you are seeing someone, um, whether it's like a pelvic floor PT or OT that can make sure your muscles are doing what they're supposed to be doing with these activities so that something does not become worse. And there is a, a way to self check for a diastasis. So if you lie on your back in a comfortable position, um, bend your knees and put your feet flat on the floor. So your knees should be at about 90 degrees. You'll place one hand in the midline of your core with your fingers flat on the midline, just as pictured. Place your other hand underneath your head and neck for support, and then lift your head slowly and begin adding pressure through the pads of your fingers so you'll be pushing down towards your spine. With no diastasis, there's a sensation of a toned wall as you lift your, um, as you lift your head up. If you feel a space or you have your fingers sink into your core, you'll likely have a diastasis. So if your fingers sink in and you feel muscle bellies on each side, that's probably, that's a sign of a diastasis. So you repeat that procedure for the areas directly above your belly button down to the pubic bone to determine whether or not the diastasis is isolated in a certain spot or if it's in your core as a whole. Because there are certain, there's different types of a diastasis. So... Um, here is a narrow slash normal, meaning um, any separation like two centimeters or, be or below is considered normal. So this is an open diastasis where it's greater around the um, belly button and then down to the pubic bone and you still have some above the belly button. You have can have below the navel where it, at the top is fine. It's just separation on the bottom. You can just have above the belly button or you can have it open um, pretty significantly from the bottom of um, the chest bone or the ribs all the way down to the pubic bone. And they present differently um, in each person. So these are just pictures of how this diastasis can present depending on the person, their body habitus, the um, where the actual separation is, how far they are along postpartum, if they have any other comorbidities present like um, hernias can also affect how it looks and how active they are. So something that you can do to help manage pressure is a log roll to get in and out of bed. Um, especially if, after you've had a C-section, you definitely want to do this. So you start out by turning onto your side, laying on your side, press, and then pressing yourself up instead of going all the way from laying on your back to sitting up. It's a, and then you go in the opposite way to lay down. Things that can help if you are early postpartum um, and you did have a pretty significant diastasis during pregnancy or is a belly wrap that actually can help with that muscle approximation in reducing the uterus size. When I used one of these postpartum because I had a six finger width separation um, while I was pregnant. Um, and like it's normal is about two-ish. And like I said, mine was six and it definitely helped. Um, granted, I did do exercises to help, but mine is like barely there, like probably two, two and a half finger widths. So it was definitely help early in the early postpartum stages. So pelvic organ prolapse. Um, there are a few different types and I'll go through the anatomical names, but just tell you what they are in layman's terms. So we have a cystocele, which is where the bladder comes backwards into the vaginal canal. So if you're looking up here, by the way, and this picture, I know it's probably kind of hard to see, but this upper left picture is anatomy without a prolapse. 
So this first one on the top right is a cystocele. I will say that these are a bit exaggerated um, and are on the more severe stages to sh just show you the significance. So we have that bladder prolapse here where the bladder is coming backwards into the vaginal canal. A rectocele is where the rectum is coming forwards into the vaginal canal. So if you ever, when you're having a bowel movement and there's like little nuggets or rabbit turds that come out first and they're harder, and then you have more softer stool, that's a sign of a rectocele. You can have a uterine prolapse where the uterus and the cervix is coming down um, the vaginal vaults. An enterocele is a small intestine prolapse. I have not seen that in the clinic. Um, personally, but I feel like that's probably people go directly to surgery for that one. And then there's a vaginal vault prolapse that it happens after um, the uterus gets removed. So that is when the vaginal wall kind of collapses on itself. And then what's not pictured is a rectal prolapse, and that's where the rectum comes out of the anal opening. So risk factors for this our pregnancy um, that increases with each one. So after three pregnancies, your risk significantly goes up. Vaginal delivery, especially if there's use of forceps, um, increased BMI, constipation because of the chronic straining and pushing, chronic cough because that's a lot of extra pressure down to the pelvic floor, a hysterectomy that can increase the vaginal vault prolapse because there's just not um, a lot of support there anymore. Uh, family history can also increase the risk. Connective tissue laxity, meaning if you have like Ehlers-Danlos, if you've ever heard of that, um, that's where like the ligaments and the tendons are, don't stay as taut. They just get a little bit more lax. Increasing age and then levator ani avulsion. That is where there's a complete tear of the pelvic floor muscles during delivery. So symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse. Um, pelvic pressure or heaviness, seeing or feeling a bulge, incontinence, which can be fecal or urgency, constipation, low back ache, especially with prolonged standing, difficulty emptying the bowel or the bladder, difficulty starting urination or starting a bowel movement, having to push around the vaginal or rectal area to start to complete a bowel movement, pain with intercourse, or feeling there's like a tampon or air bubble sensation in the vagina. So we have stages zero through four, Zero is anatomy without a prolapse. And then um, stage, and this is for the cystocele. So this is just, or the bladder prolapse. This is just an example for that. And then stage one, you just have a little bulge. Stage two, it's starting to come down a little bit more, like to the vaginal opening. Stage three is it is coming out of the vaginal opening a little bit. And stage four is it's completely coming out. So what do we do for prolapse management? So exercise and breathing, that will help with coordination and strengthening of the abdominal, pelvic floor, and hip musculature, and it helps support the pelvic organs. Pressure management. So there's uh, managing constipation, so you're not putting all of that extra pressure and straining down to the pelvic floor. Looking at lifting mechanics, so breathing out as you're lifting, and make sure you're not holding your breath. Being mindful of exercises. So um, when you're exercising and doing certain things, definitely tune into those pelvic floor muscles to see if you are increasing pressure down or feeling those pelvic floor prolapse symptoms, you'd wanna stop what you were doing. Um, and then frequent coughing, trying to manage that if you can. So um, with like asthma or people that smoke, that usually increases the risk of having a cough. So pessaries are, um, they help with supporting the pelvic organs. If you do have a prolapse, so that's also an option. There are multiple different types. Um, the fitting process is trial and error to see which one will work best for you. Some need to be removed daily and others can stay in for months. Some can stay in during intercourse. Others need to be removed. They should not be painful or cause bleeding. And then you need to make an appointment with provider for management and follow-up. So make sure that you are able to commit to that. Um, and I would go to your o OB or gynecologist to get that done. So toileting mechanics um, for having bowel movements to make sure that you are not placing a bunch of unneeded extra pressure down to the pelvic floor. So you want to put a stool under your feet because this improves what's called the colorectal angle. So if you see here that when you're just sitting with your knees at or below your hips, 
this angle is, um, it kind of kinks off the rectum. So if you see this muscle that wraps around here, if this is your rectum and that's that muscle, that muscle will pull and it can cause a kink in the rectum. In a squatting position, that the phrase is hips below knees poop with ease. So in a squatting position, that muscle relaxes and it kind of can straighten out this rectum and so you're not having to push around the ankle. So hips below knees poop with ease. You want greater than 90 degree bend in your hips. So different positions you can do for prolapse relief. These are great at the end of the day. Um, if you're feeling a lot of like pressure or heaviness, um, that usually gets worse at the end of the day. So you can even start the day with, like this to kind of um, help from the beginning. So laying flat down on your back, you can see there's really no effect on gravity, but gravity will help push that prolapse back up. So it's almost like you're bridging, but it's a supported bridge. So you have like a bolster of pillows underneath your bottom. There's also, you can bring your legs up towards your chest because that can help even more, or you can lay with your legs or your hips here supported and then your legs elevated on more pillows. If you're laying on the floor, you can have them elevated up onto like a table or a couch or a chair. So how can pelvic floor therapy help? So um, a pelvic floor physical or occupational therapist can we assess your entire system and evaluate your strength, your function, and the coordination of the abdominal, hip, and pelvic floor muscles. And all the treatments are individualized. So if I were to see five of you, you are each probably going to have different types of exercises to do because everyone's body is a little bit different. But we can address pain and discomfort. Um, if we can address labor and birth prep, so pushing mechanics, positions, positions, and birth planning. And this can be if you are, you know, pregnant and you have a prolapse. Um, there are certain positions that can actually make the prolapse a little bit worse and others that can make it better. We can check pelvic floor and abdominal strength coordination for proper functioning. If you are pregnant, we can help with lessening the risk of tearing, requiring an instrument assisted delivery, which we know that's a risk factor for prolapse. We can do exercise programming during pregnancy and early postpartum. And that is even not just for pregnant people, that is across the board. We do exercise um, program plans. And then lifestyle changes to manage symptoms. So making sure you are working on um correcting bowel movements, addressing constipation, um, bladder retraining, bowel retraining to help with manage some of those symptoms. So we are looking at the whole body. It's a very holistic approach to make sure we're hitting all the areas that could be making, making your symptoms worse. And then these are our different locations for our pelvic floor therapists. Like we have PTs and OTs that can help out. So we are as far north as Oscoda. I'm at the Midland location. We have another uh, one other therapist here in Midland. And do we have any questions? Thank you so much for sharing all that. Sounds like these are some tricky conditions, but our patients are very lucky to have your help when they need it. Um, we just had one question. I saw some people um, join. So if you do have any questions still, click that Q&A button. You can submit those anonymously if you still want to get a question in. But we did have one question that was submitted by someone on their registration. Um, it's from a woman in her 70s. She said she had a perforated colon, got diastasis recti from it, and was told there was nothing that could be done. And she said she feels like she now looks like she's nine months pregnant. So just wondering if you have any suggestions for what she could try. Yeah, so I would definitely recommend getting an evaluation from a pelvic floor therapist um, to kind of see what we can do to help. I will say that I have seen people who have had a diastasis for years and we've been able to address it. So I think there's at least always something that can be done. Um, I wouldn't focus on getting those muscles to come back together. Um, cause like I said, we can have a functional diastasis, but there's definitely core strengthening that can be done to help with that for sure. That's very good news. Um, I think that's it for us for questions. I didn't see any more come through. I do want to mention, I saw a couple of people who are live with us joined late and I just want to let you know, we're going to send out an email to everyone who registered 
that has a link to the recording. So if you missed anything at the beginning, you'll be able to go back and watch that. Um, it'll also have Dr. Katie's contact information in the email also. So thank you again for always sharing your knowledge with us. We appreciate your time, Dr. Katie. And um, anybody who needs help, she's your girl. <laughs> so thank you. Have a great day, everyone.